Okay, before we get into some specifics about the psychology of motivation, we should probably have some introduction into what is meant by experimentally investigating motivation. So sometimes when you think of motivation, you say, oh, I'm taking a course on motivation. People think of motivational speakers, right? So they tell people how to be the best people they can be and work hard and all that. This class really isn't about motivational speaking. You know, you'll learn a little bit about what motivates human beings, but we're going to get into the science of it, to the experimentation of it, and to the theory of motivation. So when we talk about motivation, we're often thinking about people who are highly motivating or must be motivated to do really great things. Sometimes it's sports heroes. Sometimes we think of motivating people, people that motivate us to do things, or people that have been very motivated themselves. Um, this is Linus Pauling, for example. He won two Nobel Prizes, two individual Nobel Prizes, one for peace and one for chemistry. You know, there's Charles Darwin and Bill Gates and Hillary Clinton, Cesar Chavez, Martin Luther King. These are people who obviously have great motivation. What, what are their characteristics? What do they have? What motivates them? But motivation is sometimes much more simple, much more focused than just this idea of people doing great things. Like advertisements. These are set up, these are designed to motivate you and other people to do things. What? To buy things. These aren't set up to give you fair in, uh, information, fair instructions about how things work and what things work well and what things don't work. They're there to get you to buy things, right? So they have techniques to get you to be motivated to purchase their product. But sometimes that can be a really bad thing. You know, this symbol right here, this is Joe Camel. He was back in the 90s. They actually had to outlaw Joe Camel because he was so identifiable by young kids, so motivating for young kids. You know, there was a survey done back in the 90s of, of fourth graders, and they were asked, uh, you know, pictures. They showed pictures of different people. Who is this? Well, a small proportion knew who the president was when they showed uh, a a a picture of the president of Bill Clinton they didn't know who that was but most of them knew who Joe Camel was that's really getting into the psyche there we oftentimes think about motivation for education we want to motivate kids in high school and elementary school to do well we want to motivate students in college I mean college is a difficult thing it costs a lot of money you must be motivated to do this especially this online class but what motivates people often sometimes is fear. Fear is a great motivator. We are biological creatures. We are animals. And we are set up to be very uh, suspicious, very characteristically focused on things that cause us to have fear and how to reduce that fear. So we see fear sometimes in advertisement, especially in politicians. Politicians tell you what to be scared of, and then they say, oh, I'm the solution to reduce that fear. So we're going to talk about this as well. There's a real dark side to motivation. Motivation isn't just about being all you can be and being a great person and I'm highly motivated. It's about manipulating behavior, pushing behavior in a specific direction. So aggression and violence, you know, these are things that um, people who are violent or aggressive, they're highly motivated. They can motivate other people to do things. Um, so that's a big part of motivation, so we'll have to talk about that. What about addiction? You know, this is something I'm particularly interested in. I'm, I, I like to study about this because addictions are a real contradiction in, in, in evolution. For example, um, we can be, people can be motivated to take drugs to the point where they hurt themselves. They reduce the safety of themselves, the safety of their children. Uh, this goes against sort of natural selection of, of survival of the fittest. But these are highly motivating things, and it can be everything from a drug, and we'll look at this, to something like gambling. This isn't a drug, but it still has a very strong motivating sense. How does that work? How can it get to a point where it can manipulate people to a great degree? Okay. 
So we're going to look at addiction uh, in a full lecture this time uh, in this class and, and talk about the strong influences of drug addictions, alcohol smoking, other drugs, and other types of addictions. What about persuasion and terrorism? I mean, what does it take to get somebody to fly a plane into a building, to motivate people to do mass murder on a global scale, to commit suicide, to blow up things? You know, this is a bit of a contradiction, but these people, the people who flew those planes, they were very motivated. Not in a good sense, not like, oh, I'm going to get out there, I'm going to go running this morning, I'm going to be on a diet, I'm going to work hard in school. But these are extremely motivated people. What motivated them to do that? Uh, these are extreme cases, but um, motivation has a pretty has a has a dark side, as I mentioned. But it also has some good side. What causes people to be giving, to be self-sacrificing or altruistic? What about to cooperation? You have to motivate people to do that. What are the characteristics that motivate them to do that when it comes to helping people or giving money? So there's a lot of things that go into manipulating behavior, moving behavior in certain directions for the good or for the bad. And we're going to have to go through a lot of them. Okay, It's not just somebody up on a stage saying, oh, be all you can be. There's a lot of influences. For example, genetics. You know, your genes, your, your natural history influences and motivates your behavior. So we'll talk a little bit about animal behavior and natural behaviors. This is something I studied for a long time. I studied zoology and biology and animal behavior even through grad school. So there are things that motivate animals that tell us a lot about what motivates us. So motivation, coming back to it. Hopefully you're getting the idea that it's not just uh, a motivational speaker. There's a lot of influences. The psychological feature that arouses an organism to action. The reason for those actions. It's the why of behavior. Why did this behavior occur and not another behavior? It's a very broad topic and it applies to almost all aspects of psychology. Sometimes I think about this course as being introduction to psychology upper division because we're going to go through so many things. So here are some approaches that I think about with psychology and this comes a lot from my biology background. I think of psychology as a science. You know John Watson says I treat psychology as a science in hopes of helping her become one. So I, well that's important. Science has a lot of rules. Science seems to move us forward in, in certain directions. So we're going to look at the scientific method. We're going to think about um, some of these complex aspects of motivation using a science lens, using a scientific lens. But psychology is a little bit different than some of the other sciences. In some ways it's a lot harder. I think a chemist or a biologist um, have it a little bit easier. Uh, psychology are different dealing with extremely complex things. For one thing, the brain. The human brain is an extremely complex thing. Our experiences, our influences by nature, by socialization, by our environment, these are very complex. And it's sometimes very hard to rein in all of these variables as a psychologist. So what is the scientific approach? Well, let's just go through um, how I see it, how a lot of other people see it, um, depends on what class you're taking. They might have a different view. But the scientific approach begins with the assumption that things are understood through our senses. So a scientific approach doesn't deal with angels and gods and stuff that are, are supernatural outside of nature, but from our observation, an empirical observation, empiricism, the focus on understanding the world through our senses. Another thing is to form a testable hypothesis. That's the second stage. We make predictions. A hypothesis comes from our empiricism, comes from ob our observation. We watch the natural world, we say we think it works in this way, and we make a statement. The world works in this way. This causes motivation. This causes the animal behavior. We run tests, we run experiments, we hand out surveys, we do observations, we run statistics. 
this is a hard part, especially in psychology, of controlling all those variables and creating the um, experimental condition, the control condition, all those kinds of things. It's very difficult. So um, we work really hard on running good experiments. Now from those results of an experiment or the culmination of a lot of experiments, we form theories. Theories in science are not whims. They're not things at the top of our head. They are well-supported ideas. The theory of natural selection as the cause of evolution. The theories of global climate change being caused by human activity, methane and carbon dioxide. These aren't just, well, I think this is happening. Theories are well supported. They're also able to change. They're able to be modified as new results come in. They're not absolutes. And then this is something we don't see a lot of, repeat. If you get results, repeat those results. Repeat in the experiments, change them slightly, repeat. We're constantly testing in science. We're constantly looking at different aspects of science. Yes, we need to repeat the results we get and that way our theories become stronger and stronger. So a few different approaches to think about um, and one is more of a reductionistic point of view, a way of looking at psychology and motivation by looking at the components okay so I tend to take a reductionist point of view when I do research I'm not saying it's the only way to, to look at psychology it's just my field right so I study neuroscience I look at animal behavior I look at simple associative mechanisms of learning biological psychology physiological responses brain waves brain waves you know basic simple research and then we theorize of some of the larger issue by looking at the small parts. Another approach is kind of on the other end, right? This is known as a holistic look. Look at the big picture. Don't look at the reduced small components like neurons and neurotransmitters, but look at societies and social psychology. This might be a gestalt approach sometimes it's put. You know, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Sometimes we can lose the value of what we're looking at by by looking at the small parts. Sometimes you have to step back. So social psychology, child development, cultural anthropology, these are all ways of looking at psychology and motivation, looking at some bigger pi pictures. We t sometimes use what are known as emergent properties, the emergence of things, things that change as they become more complex that are not reducible. Emergent properties that cannot be reduced, right? So, um, and these, these reductionistic point of views, holistic point of views, they go back and forth. So what are we concerned about as psychologists when it comes to motivation? Let's look at a few things here. Well, of course, behavior. What are the organism's capabilities? What are the energies required? The potential energy of nutrition, the kinetic energy of actual action, the actual specifics and the measurements of these behaviors at a simple reductionistic look and a holistic look, the actual action. Involuntary reflexes, autonomic nervous systems, these are reductionistic. Voluntary, somebody thinks about doing a behavior, they do a behavior. This might be involved in the muscles, the somatic system, all these interplays. So how do we record those behaviors? Um, we videotape. We scan sample, we, we um, do what are called ethograms where we create this whole list of very specific behaviors. When we see those behaviors, we mark those, check those boxes off. I did this kind of stuff with animal behavior. Um, I have a lab where I look at heart rate. I look at um, galvanic skin response, a facial EMG. These are looking at microscopic levels, reductionistic levels of behavior. So we oftentimes have to think about how do we record those behaviors? What are those telling us? We also think about the outcome of those behaviors in a very specific way. That mean, might be something like an animal pressing a lever and he gets food. The food is the outcome. But we think about it too. What about graduation, a sense of peace, money, wealth, contentment? 
Or what about punishment? The outcome of behaviors or punishment, like a drunk driver who gets punished for that behavior. We can think about outcomes and we can use some of these terms, like incentives. An incentive is what's known as the anticipation of a reinforcement. The anticipation, if I do this behavior, I get this reward. Reward is something good. An animal does a behavior, a person does a behavior, they get rewarded. Sometimes we use the term appetitive comes from the from the from the root of appetite like an animal presses lever gets some food appetite so sometimes a reward is appetitive a punishment is an outcome that is aversive it's something bad like an animal does a behavior and it gets shocked or a, a kid does a bad behavior in uh, in a class and he gets yelled at or he gets put in timeout so what factors determine how those outcomes relate to behavior well there's the per perception of the outcome how good is it? How bad is it? There's a time relationship between doing the behavior and getting the outcome. It's one of the problems with drunk driving, coming back to that example. Um, oftentimes people don't get punished for a long time after they do that kind of crime. That, that time relationship can be really bad. One of the last sections we're going to look at how the relationship between a behavior and having to wait for that outcome, whether that outcome is good or bad. How motivated would you be to do a behavior if I said, hey, why don't you wash my car and I'll pay you $50 to wash my car. Oh, that's a lot. I'll do it. Yeah, but I won't pay you $50 for another year. You'll get it in a year. How motivated would you be to do it now? These are very interesting relationships that people, including me, study a lot of. And then there's what's known as contingency, the if-then kind of statement, if I do the behavior then I get the outcome. That relationship between the behavior and the outcome. Maybe I do the behavior and only get the outcome occasionally. Then we look at drives, external drives, internal. We're going to get to that in one of the last sections. These are internal motivations. If you're hungry, if you want lots of food, you got drive. You got a hunger drive. And that's an internal hunger drive. Okay? So we're going to look at external drives, things that are given to us from the outside, and internal drives. I'm just giving you a summary of the stuff we're going to talk about in class. Hunger and thirst, these are internal drives. And this is kind of getting us in a little bit of problem because we have a really high obesity rate in our country and around the world. So we're going to have to look at hunger and thirst. We're going to look at those as reductionistic ways of looking at internal drives. What about greed? Right now we have a tremendous shift in our economics, especially in the United States. A economic inequality where rich people are making disproportionately more money. They are making more and more money than they used to in, rel in relationship to other people who are not making as much money. So the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, poorer and the middle class is kind of stagnating and going down. Well, what motivates that behavior? So we talk about drives of pleasure. One of the first things we'll talk about is hedonism, hedonic pleasure. It's a big driver. And pain, it's a big driver. To reduce pain, to increase pleasure, these are drives. Sexual attraction, okay? Tell me this isn't motivating to you. Sure motivates a lot of us. It motivates us in commercials. It motivates us uh, in the things that we do and the behaviors that we do. It's highly motivating. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. What about the person's experience? We're looking at behavior. We've talked about genetics and biology and natural behaviors and drives and internal external drives and outcome. What about coming into that situation? What is the person's experiences in history. That could be something as simple as learning, classical conditioning, instrumental conditioning, okay? The stimuli that precede the behavior, so we're going to get into that a little bit, some theory, the reasoning, the knowledge. Well, what about our culture? What about our our religion? What about our economic status? These are things we bring to a situation. These are very important. Again, this is complex. Let me give you an example of a kind of current state. Here are two birds. They're starlings. I actually studied starlings for a while when I lived in England. And 
let's say this bird has to peck a key or peck a lever and a door opens and he gets into 90 degrees Fahrenheit. That animal's current state is 100 degrees. It's not comfortable. It's too hot. And if it presses the lever, it gets into 90 degrees. And its um, situation is better. Its current state is better. So this bird over here will learn to do that. It'll learn to press a key to get into this room. But not this bird. This bird won't learn to press the key to get to the same spot, to the, get to the same reward. Why? Because it's in 80 degrees, which is very comfortable. 90 degrees isn't as comfortable. So it won't be motivated to do that. We're going to look at that when we talk about things like current state of wealth, current state of health, things like that that can motivate behavior. Okay? So we'll talk about current wealth later on. You know, what we find is people who have a great deal of money or they tend not to be as risky in their decision making than people who are poor. They make riskier decisions. They gamble more. Uh, it doesn't mean that they don't have the freedom. People who are rich have the freedom to be more risky in their investments. I'm just talking about their perception of risk. This is important in people who are in companies who are asked to take risks. It's part of their job. People who are doing very well in a company, they're high up. They avoid risk. They are risk averse. People starting in a company tend to be more risk prone. It's their current state. So, what about their history bio biologically? Their innate behaviors. Their, how did nature select them to do this? Their instincts. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, we all have a little bit of different genes, but we all have a lot of similar genes that can get us into trouble. So let me just, I'll just throw out this kind of example. Okay, here's a little armadillo. An armadillo has a genetic history, a genetic predisposition, that when it feels threatened, it balls up in a ball because it has all these armor, right? Well, that's good. It feels threatened, goes into a ball. How does that work in a modern society where if it's crossing a street and a car's coming and it feels threatened, does it run? Does it run away from the car? No. It climbs up and rolls up into a ball and the car hits it. That's a natural instinct that's not serving the animal very well right now. But we're kind of the same way. What's our natural diet? I mean, we're basically, we're homo sapiens, but we have a lot in common with our ancestors. Um, Australopithecus, for example, or Homo erectus, or Homo habilis. My favorite one is Paranthropus robustus. I love that, that name of, of one of our ancestries. Well, what did they have? Well, well uh, simple sugars weren't common. Um, fats weren't that easy to get a hold of. Salts? aren't that common in natural uh, food, but we need salts. So we have a taste bud and, and a brain set up to really find rewarding fats and sugars and salts. And that's fine if we're walking 20 miles a day and we're foraging in a place where there's not that common. But what about today? Okay, sugars are everywhere, fats are everywhere. And we have a natural history to really love those and really want those and really not have a ceiling. Oh, get a lot of those. You know, our, our ancestors probably ate the equivalent of maybe, you know, this is maybe going back, I don't know, 150 years ago. Maybe they ate two or three teaspoons of sugar a day. Nine is probably the most you should eat. How much do we eat today in sugar? About 25 teaspoons of sugar today. It's everywhere. I'm not just talking donuts. I'm talking in our cereals and in our yogurts and in our drinks. Okay, This has gotten us to a point where we have evolved to be very large as a society. This is going against our nature. Okay, In other words, if we resist sugars and fats, which are so abundant now, and salts, that goes against our nature. So we like it. And that's how people sell stuff to you. They make them sugary or fatty or, or bacon, you know, bacon. Um, and we see the rate of obesity, you know, tripling over the past 25 years. We're going to talk about that. That's as much about your nature motivating you to get excess amount of those foods as it is a society which is motivated to sell you things. So we'll look at physiology a little bit. 
We have to think about neurotransmitters, dopamine and serotonin and adrenaline, a little bit of neuroanatomy, maybe some hormones like testosterone and oxytocin. We're going to get a little reductionistic. These are physiological motivators, certainly. So here we are at the end of the first lecture, really trying to understand behavior. I mean, that's what we do as psychologists. Depend, no matter what psychologist you are, you're trying to understand the mind and behavior. The behavior of a bird, the behavior of a honeybee, the behavior of a person, a, a child in school, a, a, an adult. So we have to think about, if we want to really understand this behavior, what's their genetic history? What's their past experience? What did, throughout their life, what did they experience? What is their current state? Are they hungry? Are they thirsty? Are they rich? Are they poor? Are they angry? Are they frustrated? What about just simple preceding stimuli? Now we get a little reductionistic. What about other behaviors that they could do? Other choices? We have whole lectures in this class on choice. What about outcome? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it fast? Does it come quickly? Do you have to wait for it? These are just a few things that we look at when we try to understand the complexity of behavior, let alone trying to understand the complexity of human behavior. It's not easy. And if you're a psychology major, I don't envy you because this is a complex system. And if you want to wrap your head around it and get a good idea of how to change and motivate people to do behaviors um, that are more healthy for them, these are, there's a whole bunch of things you have to understand in order to get at that problem. But we're going to try to do that, a little bit anyway, in this class.